three, two, one. The IREC has grown into the largest competition for what they call complex rockets. They had this year, I believe, 50 teams competing, all universities. The majority of them were from the U.S. They had some from around the world. Fire. Schools are everything from Egypt, one from Canada and like England. It was a lot of teams from a lot of really great universities. You saw MIT, I saw Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Everybody was ready to go. Everybody wanted to launch their rockets. There were rockets ranging from as tall as I am to eight feet tall. It was ridiculous and it was awesome. Everyone was very focused on what they wanted to do there, which was to launch rockets. Here the solids going off and it was just like, wow, it sounded like a jet engine firing and then you'd see it go and then you'd only see like the red spark of the engine going off. And at the beginning of the competition they announced that history was going to be made this time because they had the first and only high school that had ever competed. Now this is where we are now, so we have the electronics bay here. Our rocket project. That was Charles Soda's idea and he approached me after one of the parent nights. He came in and said, you know, um, I work for Aerojet and I uh, have this idea that we could do uh, an internship and build this rocket. His college final project was to build, design and build this sounding rocket with two other students that they would then do all the math and calculations and planning for. And we were a few weeks away, we were testing it and we had the failure of one of our uh, propellant tanks. So that put everything on hold, uh, boxed it up. I came up to Washington for a job, brought the rocket along with me, and it's been sitting in my garage ever since. We ordered some extra valves just in case. And he kind of, I think, had a long-term dream of, of building that. We were looking for a meaningful problem-based learning project. Um, Charles came along with the idea of working on the first ever liquid-fueled bipropellant rocket. Okay. We hadn't been done before, and we thought it'd be fun to give it a try with juniors and seniors. I wanted to be an astronaut when I was younger, and then I realized that would be pretty much impossible. Um, but I've always had an aspiration for space and all the engineering that's involved with it. When the opportunity came around to actually work on a rocket, um, you can't really pass it up. Last year we developed the engine, and it was just about a year ago that we tested the engine for the first time up at Arlington Airport. And it, uh, it didn't work, <laughs> so we had to fix that problem. We didn't know how much work it was going to take, so we got prepared for the start of this year to do a lot of work on the engine. That really was where the focus was. So in right around the first of the year this year, the Fire Training Academy, we tested the engine. It worked beautifully. We could have built a simpler rocket and launched it, but we decided it would probably be more interesting for the students to intermingle with the other college students, so we actually entered in the competition. Once we entered in the competition, they levied requirements on us that increased the complexity drastically. We had to have uh, primary and backup systems. We had to have full redundancy. We had to carry additional mass. And in hindsight, that really was the right thing to do. We want to do something that nobody else has ever done before. If we have a successful launch, we'll be the first uh, liquid-fueled rocket to have a successful launch at all, regardless of like how well the launch goes. And if we can even do that at a college competition, us being high school students, that will make a big mark in the records of just our accomplishments. We constantly attend competitions and the school itself kind of breathes this competitive feeling of like, hey, we can do it, we're, we're there. We're almost college students, we're almost at that level. There's a few years and a few official letters and documents that are in the way of that, so why can't we be part of that uh, college rocket thing. And we had 40 students, all of them were dedicated. They all worked very hard. Some of these kids were just above and beyond. I think it was a huge learning curve for all of us to try to figure out how this is going to work and how to put this feed system together. And these sort of basic principles of aerospace uh, engineering, all, they were all new to me. I kind of got a huge crash course. Liquid fuel, we really learned there's like propulsion systems and valves and cavitation with our engine initially and like the pressure and like the whole system of a rocket, it's very, it's, I feel like there's a lot more learning opportunities. There's a small team for each system, which is pretty much necessary because of the amount of engineering that's required for each section and the amount of work that is in each section. Uh, so we learned pretty quickly um, how to delegate roles and make sure that um, everyone had something to do. We were all on the same page, how to communicate and send documents that way. Many of the components either we machined 
um, at Charles' garage or it was things we put together. It was a lot of our own design and our own engineering that went into it. It did end up being like a lot of building stuff and building it and seeing it happen is kind of what makes it all worth it. It was, it was a lot of long nights for sure. Oh, I, I spent I, midnight, 1 a.m. Uh, past even in um, Charles' garage many, many of the weekends come leading up to the launch. The pressure within the nose cup. Uh, at, at the there are about 14 different mentors. There's stuff we have to put on the rail. Mostly from Aerojet and several from Boeing. Actually the help of all the mentors who this is their job. That's, that's been something that's been uh, absolutely uh, necessary to do this and we couldn't have been doing that without them. Uh, we do think that we have probably some of the best mentors, um, even us being high school. Over the process of the past six months, the past year, we've learned an incredible amount about rockets and uh, the design problems they present. Each of our mentors and each of the sub-teams, we've worked to give us the best chance of success that we've done. One time spark. The help from Aerojet themselves and us being able to work along with the engineers there. I personally have never worked with any electronics quite like this. The capabilities as well as just the wiring itself is on a different level. The ex exposure to the um, engineering and um, science that goes into this is um, it's unreal. We just take the carbon tube. We had the kids over at Aerojet maybe a month or so before the Ezra competition. There's a, this is a live video transmitter. Got some pretty good feedback, a lot of uh, little insight from professionals in the industry, so that was really interesting to hear. How did you test the system from a systems engineering perspective? Being able to pick the brains of like professionals in the industry was, I think, a really interesting thing to do. It has 300 pounds for us. They had to brief our executive staff and our vice president asked the team that was presenting what they learned out of it and what was the most important thing that, uh, that led, would lead to the success of a, an activity like this. And one of the students, it was Emma, said the most important thing we realized was communications. And our vice president was about to hire her on the spot. <laughs> the people from Aerojet and our mentors, it's like invaluable learning about what they actually do and what the like the day-to-day -day of actually building a rocket and working on a project like this is, as opposed to like something you'd read on the internet. He had so, so much to do. And I, I thought, even up to a month before, I even told the parents, you know, we got, I didn't say 50-50 chance, but that's basically what I thought in making the schedule. And uh, the team all pulled together. Um, and they, they really, at the last minute, Everything came together, they integrated it, and everything worked. This really speaks to the fact that like, if you just like try to dream big, you can really push the boundaries as far as what, what high school students or middle school students or whoever um, you say can accomplish. Loading the entire rocket and all the paraphernalia under, underneath of the bus. Wanna put this in first? It's a bag check. Driving all the way to Utah at 1800 miles, I think, from the left. 21 hour bus ride. It was tiring for sure, but I think it was, the bus was pretty empty, so pretty fun. <laughs> the actual competition I and mean, the launch site is in the middle of nowhere. It was dry and it was hot. We got up to 110 degrees at some point. It was dusty, sometimes it was, sometimes it was windy. Pretty much always hot. You would never believe how harsh that environment is until you're out there. I mean, there was no place for us to get out of the sun operating up at the launch site area. We were surrounded by all these college students, so that was a little bit intimidating. But I mean, um, we were there with the only liquid rocket, so we had a bit of a, bit of a leg up over most of the solid and the hybrid um, motors. We absolutely had the largest launch rail in the competition. It's 40 feet tall and we have uh, three guy wires that support it. And they have to be tensioned uh, such that we can use the, the wires to adjust it. So we needed good anchors in the ground. Remember on the other side of the pivot. We could not get our anchors to go into the ground. We had to do a quick fix on that, but kids got some practice jackhammering, which was an adventure out in the middle of the desert. We used a jackhammer to drive in the anchors. So uh, that's what we had to do. It was it was quite the task to stand up the launch. Okay, keep your eye on it. We were in the advanced rocket category, so we had to do a presentation. So this team got up there and they talked about their liquid fuel rocket, and I think it was the only liquid fuel team. You were explaining every single part of your rocket, and then they'd question you about every single part very deeply. We were able to really go through our design, and you could check out our rocket and make sure that we we knew what we were talking about. And it was pretty neat because um, we were the only high school team and, and these guys were up there holding their own with college students. 
we could only launch between 8 and 10 o'clock every day. So we had this very tight launch window. And uh, this being a cryogenic liquid fuel rocket, it's liquid oxygen, it takes about a half an hour once you start putting liquid oxygen in it until you're ready to fire. So if we didn't get uh, the fueling process started by 9, we knew we weren't going to make it. So we figured out Thursday night that we better get there early to kind of stake our claim for a Friday launch. Like I don't even know morning. what time it is. At least is it 2.30 or something? 3 o'clock in the morning? Um, so we got there at about 4 in the morning every day so that we could set up our launch rail, put the rocket on the rail, do all our preliminary stuff, test out the igniter, set the igniter gas, and, and, and work out any issues, which we had a couple uh, that came up so that we would be ready to start fueling at the start of the launch window. And the problem there is there are multiple teams that want to launch within that two hour window. Every team that has a misfire requires another 15 or 20 minutes before they can approach their rocket. And what else do you have to do out here before you start to launch? There's other teams that, you know, they go into a no fire or they have a hang fire where you're just waiting for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes where you can't work on your rocket and get prepared to launch. And you're just burning out of the window. So on Friday that happened where we, we didn't have enough time and we launched, we lost our launch windows. The time crunch would have been uh, would have been manageable but difficult if we were the only team that was launching. But you add the other teams, things just take a lot longer. You've got to close down the site when you're fueling, you've got to close down the site when you're getting ready to launch. If you don't launch, you have to close down the site again. It's a logistical nightmare. There's always going to be some things you can't change and so that's where designing it to be erected quickly and to work with that scenario would really help. If we had known that there were going to be that many people launching and the window had been shortened, I think we definitely would have made some changes in some advanced planning. It was disappointing, but at the same time we knew we had the next day and we knew we were, the rocket was more or less ready at that point, so we were still confident. Saturday, we decided that instead of getting up at 2.30 in the morning, we'd get up at, I think it was 3 in the morning. Day 3, um, having gotten pushed yesterday, yesterday uh, it's, it's an exciting moment. Excited? There's a lot of things that have to go well together in order for it to work, but we've tested them all independently and they work. So we got the rocket mounted early, we got things hooked up, like monitor idle. we got it fueled with ethanol, we hooked up our helium, we hooked up our liquid oxygen, and then just at that time another team was ready to launch so we had to walk away. We ended up having to wait for them to launch and then they hang fired and then we had to wait for the hang fire procedure and then we could actually go back to the rocket and continue working. The area we had to work in at the actual launch site, it wasn't ideal for this many high altitude teams this close together. Ideally we'd be spread out, we'd have our own days and the windows would be much bigger, but that's just a logistical problem that you can't really work around to some degree. So We've en encountered some unexpected problems. Part of it was that having left that out to the elements, the uh, machines started to malfunction and we needed to make sure that everything was properly set up. The map gas is a liquid in the tank and so if it gets too hot, it turns into a gas and just overpressurizes the line and the line kept popping off of the valve that it was attached to. We actually got ready and we were just going to be shy of getting ready by 10 o'clock, which is their end of their launch window, but luckily Ezra called FAA. FAA gave them a three hour extension. So we were all ready, got everything buttoned up, and the last few minutes of buttoning up the rocket are very, very hectic because you have to close it up. Can we have safety glasses on everybody near the rocket? When you're working under such a tight time constraint, you leave things out, you forget little things like when they were locks fueling, I know that they started grabbing tools and then forgot where they set them down because they had to rush off and do something else to get it done in time and then he was rushing to put the door on and drop some of the screws and, and, and so when you rush you kind of miss some things. And in that time you've got the liquid oxygen which is in there now starting to evaporate or boil off so you have to get it closed up and you really have about five minutes to get it all closed up. Helium. Open. Igniter. Get far enough away where you're back at the launch console and going or else Basically, you'll start venting the liquid oxygen, and that's not good. We got it all ready, walked away, go through the countdown, press the button. Open. Verified. And nothing happened at all. Charles? No. When we did have our, our launch attempt on Saturday, we, we narrowed it down to there was one point of failure where the motor just didn't turn all the way, and we were able to figure out we knew exactly what was wrong. We were able to fix it, but there just wasn't enough time of the day. We had thought that was our last launch window, so we were all just very 
um, very disappointed. Immediate thought was, yeah, I think we're done. Um, but I think we, uh, 10 or 15 minutes later, we get the message from Charles and a few of the judges <laughs> um, for a potential launch the next day um, outside of the competition window. We could definitely launch Sunday, fix this one problem. And for the most part, everything on Sunday went pretty smoothly. Even though it's not the competition, we still want to launch it because that's realistically what we wanted. Sunday morning was going to be do or die. So we get down to it, everything's working great, we get through all the problems we had the previous day, we get the igniter to work, we get the map gas torch to work, we get the valve to work, which had stuck the day before. Everybody was getting the jitters. We, uh, that, at that point was when we truly realized it's real and we're going to launch this rocket. We had the people that knew what they were doing, doing what they were doing. Everybody else was just standing around excitedly. Where do we stand? We got back and went through the countdown again. Igniter. On. Press the button. Fire. Fire. And the main engine, which is the liquid engine, started beautifully, just like it should. Uh, we have fuel. We have a good burn on the main engine. We fire the two solid rocket boosters. They appear to ignite, and we are just waiting for it to take off. Everything looked great, telemetry data coming back, said the rocket was doing what it was supposed to do, except it just sat there. It didn't move. There was fuel coming out, so. Well, I mean, so it sat for 30 seconds on the launch rail, operated perfectly, but didn't fly. And it all comes down to a little pin which holds the rocket down to the launch rail. Didn't break when it was supposed to break. Everything went perfectly except for the, the shear pin that course failed. I think it was a huge learning curve for all of us to try to figure out how this is going to work and how to put this feed system together. But I'm really proud that we did the liquid engine. I, um, I, I'm really happy that we really pushed I really pushed past even most of the college teams and as far as um, doing really daring engineering. All, all in all the experience it, it couldn't have really gone better um, for the first attempt. You know there's always something that's going to trip you up and we've proven well, we basically just satisfied just fired our rocket in a static test for 30 seconds and we just proven the whole system works, right? It didn't go anywhere, but the entire complicated fee system of a liquid fuel rocket worked perfectly. So we proved that we basically, we made a functioning rocket. The rest of it is just down to the small details of getting it to go up. We're not done yet, but um, things that are ambitious take time. Field, Washington, and we're going to be launching our rocket today. The rocket is going to have to launch. It's going to line up this way, right, right against here. The whole setup process is pretty smooth. We did our usual troubleshooting of power supply issues. Getting more vertical. That's okay, though. But we got that sorted out. Over the tail has to go south. Up, up, up. Probably one of the best projects I could have done. Even though I was there working on it until the wee hours of the morning, a majority of the time. It was something I really enjoyed doing and like I was willing to put the effort in. It's a complicated system. A lot can go wrong. I think we have demonstrated everything independently works. So the question is, does it all work together? This is stuff that you don't get to do at any other high school or at a lot of colleges you don't get to do this until you're a master's or you're already working in the field. Just getting access to that kind of stuff I think is invaluable. I think we'll be fine. I think in the next Half an hour we'll be ready. We're ready to start fueling. Awesome. It was a challenging project, for sure. We could have done solids, and solids would have been easier. We'd been closer to pushing a button and having it go instead of the 30 point pre flight checklist that has to happen in the last two minutes. It was everything from designing and working together in teams and collaboration to um, just learning machining concepts and um, basic engineering principles, as well as like the very foundations of sort of this aerospace and rocketry. Uh, it was a huge, huge step forward for me as I go to college and I pursue um, things uh, for d different ventures in aerospace or mechanical engineering. Ethan, can we have separate control for the ethanol? How well the students performed. I don't think you could ask for better. They're everybody as good, I think, as the engineering staff we have at our company in terms of the ability to execute tasks, the ability to get them and done and where they lacked I think in some of the knowledge we pointed them in the right direction and they can do anything they need to now I think to launch the rocket. I think on the electronic side 
Like the kids are far superior than the mentors in the electronics side here. Stunts. Traffic is clear. Okay, is everybody ready? Ready. We got the ring. Got They're all go. Avionic. Go. Helium. Open. Igniter. On. Gas. On. Go. Prop valve. Open. In the end, what stopped us was the uh, isolation valve, which had worked every time until now. It's kind of a letdown to have gone this far and working since 6 in the morning again. But um, I think we're running out of things that can go wrong, <laughs> which probably means we can uh, learn how to fix it. Most likely we're going to try and continue this project and try again in the winter because we have a group of very determined, very incredibly stubborn people who will not let this go. The rocket, um, it's, it'll fly. We have to figure out when. And we're all going off to college, so we have to figure out when we're going to find a time to get everybody back together to launch the rocket. But yeah, we'll do that. And it'll fly.